We all strive to live a long, prosperous, and healthy life. With advances in health and medical sciences, this goal is ever more attainable. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is a nonprofit organized research unit under the auspices of the University of California at San Diego, committed to advancing lifelong health and independence through research, education, and patient care. To better empower and improve the lives of young and old alike, the Stein Institute presents the following program. My job tonight is to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Amy Jack. Dr. Jack received her doctorate in clinical psychology with a specialization in neuropsychology from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, she did her undergraduate work at Miami of Ohio. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship in neuropsychology at the VA San Diego Healthcare System Veterans Medical Research Foundation and is currently an assistant professor in residence of psychiatry at UCSD and a research psychologist at the Veterans Affairs San Diego Healthcare System. Dr. Jack's research focuses on neuropsychology and neuroimaging in normal aging and mild cognitive impairment. Specifically, her current research examines how protective behavioral factors, for example, physically and mentally active lifestyles, impact your cognition and brain structural integrity. Additionally, her research examines the potential for activity levels to modify genetic risks for cognitive decline. So it's our privilege to have Dr. Jack here tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out and thank you for your attention. Um, I am going to talk about the impact of exercise on cognitive functioning and this is by way of a, a small outline for the, the topics that I will address tonight. First of all, I'll give a little bit of information about why we might be even interested in the relationship between exercise and, and cognition in older adults. What are the cognitive benefits of exercise? Is it limited to just one area of thinking? Does it uh, span more broadly? What are the brain changes, the actual, some of the physiological or structural brain changes that are related to exercise or increased activity levels? And then some of the more recent information that's, that's come out has really focused on, again, not just this relationship, but how that relationship comes about. So how does exercise actually impact the way that we think and our cognitive abilities? And then, of course, there's always a section at the end about all of the stuff that we don't know yet that we're trying to, to figure out and, and where, in fact, we need to go from here to, to continue to answer these questions and make this relationship between exercise and cognition to clarify that relationship a little bit. So um, by way of just a little bit of a background about me and why I'm particularly interested in this topic is, um, as you heard in the introduction, I am a neuropsychologist. My area of interest is in aging and disorders of uh, cognitive disorders of aging. And so as I would see patients and, and give information about people's cognitive functioning and unfortunately have to sometimes deliver unfortunate news about declines in cognition, it began to wear on me that uh, I, I could give very detailed information to those individuals about what their cognitive functioning looked like presently and some of the changes that had likely happened over time that again were not in the positive direction but we were la uh, lacking a little bit in then suggestions or anything that's empirically supported about what to do about those declines um, and so again this this stemmed from an interest to try and find what are those things that that we have control over some just behavioral interventions what can we do to try and um, age as, sex, as successfully as possible particularly in the cognitive domains and then more globally if you look at um, at this diagram you know the overall goal then is to keep people at the normal aging end of the spectrum that's the overall point of all this is to keep people from progressing down the line into something that's not so positive either into uh, mild cognitive impairment 
impairment, which is often thought as a precursor to Alzheimer's disease or dementia, or certainly onto the full dementia syndrome. We're very much trying to keep people closer to the normal edge of that, uh, of that spectrum and finding ways to, again, either prevent any conversion to dementia or, at a very minimum, try and delay that onset if, if we can't fully prevent it. And so a lot of these behavioral factors, things again like exercise that I'm going to talk about tonight, but other things that, that you may hear about as well, cognitive activities, diet, other lifestyle factors um, may very strongly contribute to um, at least delaying the onset of, of unfortunate cognitive changes with age. And certainly, there's a lot of motivation to, to do that from a personal level that, that we all want to hopefully age successfully and have good cognitive outcomes with aging. But on, on a global scale, um, the way that the numbers are projected currently is rather sobering, as you can see from this slide, that if, if nothing changes, if we don't come up with better interventions or, or something that will stem the tide of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, um, it it does continue to grow almost exponentially over the course of the next 30 to 40 years such by that uh, 2050 the projection is 14 million older adults are expected to have Alzheimer's disease and and that's not acceptable to me so we're we're working we're working uh, so it, it might not be a, a particularly direct connection to think that exercise would impact cognitive functioning. Certainly the link is much maybe more clear between exercise and physical health and physical functioning. But overall there are so many general <coughs> benefits of exercise that it's given as a blanket recommendation oftentimes for all kinds of, of issues. Medical, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancers, obesity, mental health concerns. It's, it's known to help alleviate some symptoms of depression, anxiety. And so again, when you, when you see the potential benefit of exercise in all of those domains, while again, it may not be the first thing you'd think of, it's maybe not such a, a big leap to think, well, maybe it'll help with cognition too. It seems to help so broadly with other things. Let's see what it looks like, uh, exercise and its benefit to, to our thinking skills. And then certainly we've learned actually a lot from, from the animal literature. A lot of work has been done in, in rodents and other animals to really pave the way for the work that's going on now in humans looking at exercise and its relationship to our cognitive functioning. Uh, again, a lot of work has, has focused on rodents and looking at things like enriched environments. So environments like you see in the picture, things that are uh, stimulating, colorful, interesting to, to look at and for, for the animals to explore, as well as the wheel so that they have options for exercise. And certainly it's been demonstrated time and time again that those sorts of enriched environments really do contribute strongly and have a positive effect on neuronal growth, so positive actual brain changes, as well as on the systems involved in learning and memory. So we take some of our cues, again, from the animal literature to think, okay, so we give animals an enriched environment and opportunities to have physical activity, and lo and behold, their functioning seems to improve in many domains. What Does, does that hold up in, in humans? So uh, the work that's been done thus far really does show that there are observable cognitive benefits in individuals who exercise. So this is, this is the short version of my talk, this slide right here. <laughs> this pretty well sums it up, that the converging evidence, now there certainly are some studies that, that actually don't find this relationship. It's not 100% across the board, everyone finds this, but the vast majority of the evidence, again, taking from animal and human literature is converging to suggest that those individuals who participate in physical activity and exercise do have improved cognitive functioning compared to individuals who are more sedentary. That really is the bigger picture message. Um, I'm going to try and break that down and give you some more specifics about that, but like I said, if, if I had to, anyway, if anybody really had to leave early, you've, you've heard the, <laughs> the, the first take-home message anyway, but I'll give you some more specifics as well. 
Okay, so again, what, what really is that relationship then between exercise and, and cognition? So physical activity, it is related to better just overall cognitive functioning and actually particularly in older adults. So this work has been done across the lifespan to try and, uh, again, determine does it, does it help for young children? Does it help in middle age? Does it help for older adults? And, and there's some evidence that would suggest that yes, it probably does help in general across the lifespan, but the changes are particularly noticeable for individuals in the older segment of the population. And so that's particularly encouraging, again, for folks that are, are reaching those decades of life and, and again, for us that are, uh, us folks that are studying these sorts of things, that it really does seem to be a quite robust relationship in, in older adults. And not only does uh, exercise seem to lead to improvements in cognitive functioning, it may extend and then actually prevent cognitive decline over time. Again, maybe not permanently, but at least it will delay those declines. And then regularly scheduled activities seem to offer more protection than people who are sort of hit or miss about it. Part of that may be, again, that a routine of regular exercise, that you need more exercise to reap those benefits. It also may relate to some of the other benefits that go along with exercise, especially if you're working or you know in a social group, that you walk with another group of individuals, or you play tennis with partners, or, or whatever, that there may be some, again, additional benefits that if you have a scheduled tea time for golf or a standing date that you walk or again go swimming with people that all of those other social and potentially intellectual benefits that go along with it are also contributing to the actual physical exercise benefits. Um, and then for, for the women in the audience, actually the relationship between activity and cognition is a particularly strong in women. That's not entirely clear why that's the case, and it's not that the relationship doesn't exist in men, it's just that when you include a preponderance of women in samples, the re, uh, that relationship is strengthened. And so again, it seems to be particularly important for, for women to have these, this relationship and to use cognitive, uh, to use exercise rather, to, to boost cognition. Uh, again, so like I said, it, it's helpful and it's particularly relevant to, to older adults, the relationship between exercise and, and cognitive functioning. But if you go back even a couple of decades into midlife and, and then follow those people over time, it really does appear that if, that if you've started a more active lifestyle during, during the middle decades of your life, that it is associated with a decreased risk of dementia later in life. Um, again, so regular physical activity may reduce your risk of dementia over time. And this is particularly true for individuals who have a high genetic risk for cognitive decline. I'll, I'll touch more on that specifically in, in just a few minutes. But, but I thought that piece was particularly encouraging as, again, a way that behaviorally one can try to modify some of their genetic risks since we didn't get to pick our parents and there's not much we can do about our genes it's nice to know that we do maybe have a little bit of flexibility that our behaviors can modify some of those risks the other thing that was notable over the course of time again if you follow folks you know for for 10 or so plus years that individuals who maintained a fairly similar exercise regimen similar in duration similar in intensity to the best degree that they could over time seem to, again, reap more benefits than individuals who over the course of time cut, scaled back or had to decline in, in duration or intensity of their exercise routines. Um, again, so that's some of the information that we can gather from looking at things slightly more from a longitudinal standpoint. Okay, so what about the actual cognitive domains. What, what, does, what is exercise helpful for? Well, the good news is that it actually appears to be reasonably helpful across the board. Different people break down different cognitive domains and include different things, but um, this data that's presented here was from a meta-analysis, so looking at a broad base of studies and trying to analyze them collectively to come up with, again, the bigger picture of what's going on. So you can see in red, it's the uh, individuals who have engaged regularly in exercise exercise or are the fit group versus controls who perhaps are more sedentary. And you can see across every domain, executive would be things like higher order cognitive skills, planning, problem solving, um, sequencing. 
controlled is more controlled attention. Spatial is kind of what it sounds like, things that require spatial um, orientation and spatial information. And the last one being speed. That's uh, psychomotor speed, so the speed with which one can translate things in your mind to actually carrying them out, or just sheer motor speed. And you'll see that across the board in all those domains, the group that exercised more, again, did better on cognitive tests in those domains, particularly in executive functioning, which actually is a little bit surprising um, looking historically. One of the first things that people anticipated might be related to uh, one of the first cognitive functions that might be related to exercise was simply speed of processing. Perhaps because that follows a little more logically that if you're exercising and you're working your muscles and you're getting the blood flowing that you're going to be faster at things. And certainly that shows up. But it was a little bit more of a stretch to think that basically the, the highest level of, of cognitive skills would be what was actually most impacted by exercise. And that's actually somewhat encouraging though that we have the ability to, to impact those higher order cognitive skills as well as some of the more simple speed and reaction time skills. Um, and again, it, it looks like across the board, the, the gains in, in these domains are about, uh, on average, a half of standard deviation gain from, from the time one to time two or the testing over time on these, on these domains. Okay, so, so the, you know, the, the big picture that, that it does look like, yeah, exercise is good for, what's good for your heart is good for your head kind of thinking. Well, but how? How does that, how is that relationship really manifesting itself? How is that uh, taking place? And, and there's lots of, of thought about this. Um, one of them is just, you know, you get general health gains from exercise. So if you are exercising, you may have a uh, lower cardiovascular risk load or you've lowered your blood pressure because you've started exercising. And if you have lower blood pressure, you're at lower risk for stroke. And if you're at lower risk for stroke, you're then at lower risk for cognitive decline because of stroke or things like that. So it's kind of a cascade effect from just general health benefits. And that's certainly possible. Uh, another thought is that it's because of increased ability for the heart to deliver oxygen. Your brain needs oxygen to function as does the rest of your body. If it's kind of more efficient in body, you're more efficient in your mind as well. Similarly, for increased uh, cerebral blood flow, that, that's, that possibly leads to improved uh, metabolic functioning in the brain. Again, just adding or having more available resources for you to respond to, to whatever the task demands are, whatever you're being asked to remember, or whatever problem you're being asked to solve. There's also some, some chemical uh, cholinergic changes in the brain which uh, are directly related to the learning process, how you actively actually acquire information that may be part of the positive change that comes from exercise. Another one is simply uh, the potential to have increased resistance to general brain insult. Again, if you use the analogy of the brain as a muscle and you're exercising and you're reaping all of these uh, cognitive benefits, you may have just strengthened your your reserve against whatever potential insult might come down the road. Heaven forbid a head injury or a stroke or something else. You may just have a better wherewithal to, to respond to those things. And then another one would be general stress reduction. There's, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that uh, consistent high levels of stress do impact our brain and our cognition. Exercise is an excellent stress reduction technique, so it's sort of a cascade effect that if you're exercising, you're, in general your stress levels will be reduced and therefore you're going to avoid these negative consequences of stress uh, that stress creates in, in the plasticity of the brain. And, and these items should not really be thought of as, as mutually exclusive. It's, it's likely and, and entirely possible that they're all interacting together or some of them together. Again, it's probably not that we're looking for one over the other, but that there's some combination of all of this that's, that's impacting cognition um, through exercise at a very global level. 
The other thing that, that's going on, uh, which is much more recent as far as the literature goes, especially in humans, that is, is that it really does appear that exercise has an impact not only on cognition, but actually brain structure. The integrity of one's brain seems to be impacted by exercising. Uh, this, is, again, has first been shown in animals and has led to much more recent human uh, research, but that it really has been implicated in structural brain changes as well as maintenance of brain volume over time as well as uh, functionality of the brain and perhaps more efficient functional uh, capabilities of the brain related to exercise. Okay, so what are those brain changes related to physical activity? Um, most of these studies, uh, again, are fairly recent. They're hitting more global aspects of the brain. They'll get more detailed over time. But what we know so far is that it does really seem to increase both gray and white matter in the brain, as well as overall brain volume. Uh, in, in this study here by Colcom et al, who has done a lot of work in this area, the largest changes in volumes were actually present in the frontal lobes. And maybe not surprisingly, if you just think back to what I was telling you about what cognitive functions were most impacted by exercise, and, and one of those was executive functionings, higher order cognitive skills, the frontal lobe is particularly relevant to carrying out those higher order tasks. And lo and behold, that's one of the areas that seems to have the, uh, be most impacted volume wise anyway by exercise. Uh, it also seems to contribute to lower risk for brain volume loss over time. And part of that volume loss could be construed as, as normal, but at a certain point it does reach an abnormal state. And it seems that uh, exercise may help stem some of that atrophy over time. Uh, so as I said, the exercise does result in increases in, in gray and white matter. That The gray matter is the blue area there that you see, um, which is particularly involved in higher order attentional control. And then the white matter that's uh, affected is, is the yellow area. And again, it's frontal white matter tracts that allow communication between the hemispheres. So that uh, one could infer that that's contributing then to improved efficiency, that if the brain's kind of communicating amongst all its centers better, you're going to have more efficient cognitive functioning. Um, that, again, what I just presented was, was more structural information derived from, from magnetic resonance imaging. This now is looking more at the functional status of the brain, also derived from MRI, but from functional MRI. So uh, this was following a six-month walking intervention. Those who had excuse me, higher uh, aerobic fitness showed increases in activity in the middle frontal gyrus and superior uh, parietal cortex, which are also related to attentional control, as well as then decreases in activation in the anterior cingulate. And that may seem a little counterintuitive that that decrease actually is probably a positive thing. The reason for that is that the anterior cingulate, one of the things that, that we're fairly confident that it, it does for us is that it helps us um, filter out information, make uh, decisions focused, attentional processes, and like I said, help uh, filter out distractions. And so if your brain is functioning more efficiently, which perhaps resulted from the exercise, your anterior cingulate may not have to work quite as hard to, to do its job because your brain is already sort of taking over and, and doing all of those things. And so that center that's, that's involved in, in filtering and, and trying to manage all of that just doesn't have to work as hard. Again, leading to that decreased activation. And then those patterns of fMRI activation were um, then related to behavioral performance. So they gave them also a measure of selective attention and they were able to perform better uh, on those, the folks that had that pattern of activation. So again, it was in the brain as well as translated into actual behavioral performance. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit to think about, so how does exercise impact our brain structure? 
Um, one of the things that, that is, is widely accepted at this point is that exercise seems to increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, as well as some other nerve, nerve growth factors, although BDNF has certainly received the most attention in the literature. The, the role of those growth factors is really to um, aid in synaptic connections, cap, uh, increase capillary beds, cell body um, volume, and so if exercise is increasing BDNF, which then subsequently increases all of those things I just mentioned, you can see the connection between how that then might relate to some of these volumetric changes. Um, exercise also may contribute to, and has actually recently been shown not only in animals but in, in humans, to contribute to actual neurogenesis of, uh, in the brain, neuron proliferation, increased survival of, of neurons, particularly in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, which I'll talk about in more detail in a minute as well. Um, so, okay, so for BDNF, the, the way we're thinking about it at this point is that it, it's, we think that it's upregulated when you exercise. And because it's a mediator of synaptic uh, efficiency and neuronal connectivity, uh, those two things lead again to some of those, those structural changes. Um, it's also necessary for long-term potentiation, which is the process required to facilitate formation of memories. So again, it kind of follows that if you're exercising and you're upregulating this process in your brain, it's going to possibly contribute to increased memory as it cascades down, down the series of events that occur in the brain. It's also necessary then for the growth and survival of new neurons. So it, it leads to that, that tree of events where you have aerobic training, which leads to increased levels of BDNF and subsequently all of those uh, wonderful proliferations of uh, neurons, neurogenesis, increased plasticity in the brain. That's the thought presently anyway. Some other things that, that might, uh, BDNF might be doing, um, again, this is from the animal literature, but in rats, they fed uh, the rats a high-fat diet. And the high-fat diet, they demonstrated reduced hippocampal uh, levels of BDNF and then also induced a deficit in spatial learning. So they put them in a, a water maze and they have difficulty finding the platform that they may ordinarily, if they hadn't had the high-fat diet, been able to find easier. And then exercise, when they then let the animals have free exercise again, it reversed that decrease in BDNF, and then all the downstream uh, effects re uh, restoring essentially the memory and the ability to, to complete the water maze and that, and that spatial activity. So it's possible again that, that the BDNF is able, maybe not independently, but at, to contribute to uh, I don't know, modifying some of the other poor behavior choices that we make when we decide to, you know, eat something that maybe isn't the best for us, that it's, it's helpful in trying to overcome some of the negativity of other behavioral factors that, that might be at play. Okay, so as I mentioned before, one of the main places that, that has been studied, uh, and so you can't necessarily exclude that this is going on somewhere else in the brain, it's just uh, folks have been really highlighting the area of the hippocampus and the dentate gyrus, but that it really does see that exercise might target this area specifically. And the hippocampus is very important in memory. It's one of the first areas to atrophy in things like Alzheimer's dementia. So again, if we're trying to figure out how to stem the tide of that atrophy and now we're finding something that specifically uh, uh, is targeting that area, that's of great interest. The exercise does seem to impact cerebral blood volume to this area, as well as the blood volume changes in this area then are subsequently related to positive cognitive changes. So again, this is a, an area of particular interest, and it, and it has been, like I said, the hippocampus has always been of particular interest given its relationship to memory and to Alzheimer's disease and um, other cognitive disorders of aging. And so it's really quite, uh, quite exciting to find um, several pieces of evidence that really uh, seem to show that it, it's targeting this area that exercise has a specific benefit to the hippocampus. Um, 
again, in some animal literature, after if you give rats the opportunity to run voluntarily on their on their wheels and they increase their levels of BD enough because of the exercise, it does seem to be uh, particularly relevant to the the hippocampus and the neurons and the dentate gyrus. And, and these changes appeared in several days, so they appeared quite quickly. It doesn't take that long for the for those changes to be seen. And then those changes did seem to persist. So they, they continued to let the animals have exercise, but it wasn't like it sort of had an explosion and it got better and then it tapered off. Those, you know, those changes seemed to persist after several weeks of exercise. The other thing, and I, I said I'd come back to this, is the impact of of exercise then and genetic risk for cognitive decline. So you all may have heard of the APOE4 allele. It's a it's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It's over it's definitely overrepresented in individuals with Alzheimer's disease and it if people possess this specific allele it tends to raise your risk for things like Alzheimer's disease about one and a half to three and a half times what what you might normally have. And and so one of the, I think, really exciting uh, potentials for exercise is that there is some evidence to suggest that the risk for cognitive decline in inactive individuals that have this allele was nearly four times greater than the risk for those who are physically active but possess this risk gene. So again, this presents some information, albeit you know not, not yet widely replicated, but it's encouraging that there is some potential for the behavioral choices to impact some of the genetic risk. And again, I think it makes some sense because this particular risk factor is just that. It's a risk factor. So everybody who has it doesn't go on to get Alzheimer's disease, and lots of people who don't have the risk gene still go on to get Alzheimer's disease. And so it's interesting then there, to think that there really must be some sort of uh, you know gene environment interaction and, and what's really driving that. So um, I think it's encouraging to think about using behavioral interventions and strategies to at least reduce one's um, potential for genetic risk for cognitive decline. The other thing that's that's I think somewhat encouraging is is as I said you know people who start exercising in midlife seem to have reduced their risk for Alzheimer's disease and and that's that's all good news as well, but what about people who maybe have already begun to decline because of a mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease? And it does appear that cognitive functioning actually can reap benefits from exercise in, in both clinical and non-clinical populations. Um, it seems to lower risk for cognitive impairment overall, especially in women, as I mentioned earlier. It might delay onset of dementia, and it, it actually seems to help help bolster cognitive activity and other, um, other positive behaviors in individuals who already have some level of, of cognitive impairment. So in Alzheimer's disease, this is a study, a very recent study from Burns and colleagues, and in individuals who have early uh, Alzheimer's disease, so in the early stages, they found a very nice relationship between higher fitness levels and larger uh, white gray matter as well as whole brain volumes. And that's what's depicted here for you is that relationship between um, fitness levels and the whole brain volume, which basically is just showing that the more fit you are, the larger brain volume that you have and again that contributes we think to to the reserve capacity that that helps to um, stem, stem the tide of, of atrophy over time it also seems that in, in Alzheimer's disease that higher levels of fitness then are associated with reduced brain atrophy over time again both of which are encouraging even in a population which has already had had sort of a hit to their cognition that they still may be able to uh, extend extend some of the cognitive abilities that they have and maintain at least that level of functioning for longer 
and again the, the goal would be to to keep people more towards either the middle uh, picture which is what a, a normal brain would look like versus mild Alzheimer's disease in the middle and certainly to prevent it from getting to a severe level um, and that's again the the reason that the relationship between exercise and brain structure is so uh, intriguing is because if it holds any possibility again to to reduce this level of atrophy to avoid people um, moving into the severe end that would be optimal of course and then this is some pilot data that that I've been working on um, over the last year or so and and I think this fits really with the bigger picture um, of what's going on between normal aging all the way to, to Alzheimer's disease, this is a, a small sample of individuals who have mild cognitive impairment. So these individuals, they're not demented, but they also don't have fully normal cognition either. They, they do represent a high risk group actually for, to convert to Alzheimer's disease. And so they're partic of particular interest to find interventions for this group, again, to help uh, reduce the likelihood that they will convert to Alzheimer's disease or at least delay that that conversion time and it essentially uh, is quite similar to the the previous slide with Alzheimer's disease that if you look at the relationship between um, this is actually hippocampal volumes and the relationship between frequency of all exercise and it does show a positive relationship that the more the more active one is the larger their hippocampus is again even in a mildly impaired population they're still able to um, reap some of the benefits of exercise on on their brain volume, particularly in the hippocampus, which as I said is so related to memory. The nice thing too I think about this um, data, albeit preliminary, is that um, the, the first graph shows frequency of all exercise, whereas the second one shows frequency of moderate exercise. The moderate exercise is really exercise done for the sheer purpose of aerobic benefit, to raise your heart rate and you see, you know, it's exercise in the traditional form. You put on sporty clothes and you go and you run or you play tennis. Whereas the first um, graph actually depicts a little bit more broad-based approach to activity. So it includes those things, but it also includes things more like basic walking in your neighborhood or things that are active but maybe not done specifically for aerobic benefit. And so even that level of physical activity seems to impart the benefit uh, to the, the hippocampal volume. So again, it seems to be a broad spectrum of activities that folks can participate in. The key is to be active in some fashion. And then following from that, uh, you know, it's, it's great if we can preserve hippocampal volume, but if it doesn't actually do anything behaviorally for us for the outward um, cognitive abilities, it's only maybe half the battle. And so the relationship is there that individuals then who did um, exercise more had better verbal learning and memory as well as stronger response inhibition or a, a test of executive functioning. So those relationships um, are there for the actual cognition as well as for the brain structure. So, so here's where the, the answers get more and more murky, I guess. Um, but the things, these are unfortunately also the things that people want to know. You want to know, well, okay, what do I have to do? And how long do I have to do it? <laughs> what's, what's the, what exercise is going to actually give me the most benefit and how many days a week and, and how long? These are actually a lot of the questions that really are still being ironed out and there's no uh, maybe one size fits all. There's a little bit of, of evidence that, that I'll tell you about to give some guidance, but we're, we're a long way from having sort of a, a prescription to say, you know, for your condition, for your particular uh, strengths and weaknesses cognitively, um, you should do this. Um, one thing that's, that's come out, a lot of studies have been really focused on aerobic training and aerobic training alone. And there is some evidence to suggest that if you combine strength training with aerobic training, you actually reap greater cognitive benefits than aerobic training alone. Now, does that negate the, the benefits of aerobic training? Absolutely not. But it may just be one of those things to investigate further to see if you can get a little more bang for your buck, so to speak, by actually adding some resistance or some strength training to um, cardiovascular training. 
Uh, a lot of this generally falls along good common sense, but there are questions that, that we never really knew the answers to. Uh, brief training programs are good, but longer training programs are likely to be better. Meaning that if you, you know, sign up for a month long class at, at the YMCA, that's great. But if you join a gym and go regularly month after month after month, that actually is most likely to provide <laughs> the, the greatest benefit. Um, Neurocognitive benefits, they actually appear to be able to accrue quite quickly over a relatively short time frame. Again, you know, maintaining it longer will probably serve better um, overall, but that, again, even if you did a shorter time frame exercise intervention, that the benefits will begin to accrue relatively quickly. Short bouts of exercise tend to have less impact on cognitive functioning, short being less than 30 minutes, but this is, I think, quite speculative still at this, at this point um, because there's so many potential variables and people study this very differently as far as is, uh, is this group required to exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week, versus this other group who's only exercising 20 minutes a day, but they do it seven days a week. So it's those sorts of things that maybe aren't as clear cut. Um, you know, taking a very global recommendation, greater than 30 minutes is probably better, but if you do greater than 30 minutes only one day a week, maybe that's not better than doing 20 minutes three days a week. And these are a lot of the things that we're still trying to, to figure out. Other things that people have been asking about recently too are not just strength and aerobic training, but other things like yoga, like tai chi, things that are active and uh, require posture, stability, flexibility, those sorts of things. And, and do those exert any benefits on our cognition? It's probably too early to really come to any definitive conclusion because there's so little uh, empirical evidence in this area, but the initial, the initial picture is that yoga doesn't appear to, to give the same kind of cognitive benefits that aerobic activity does, but that's not to say that it doesn't give you benefits in other areas, like in mood improvements, general uh, sense of well-being, increased energy, and some of those other things. The other thing that I'll say about uh, the relationship between yoga and some other uh, forms of activity and cognitive functioning and why it's difficult to draw those conclusions is that oftentimes cognitive functioning wasn't studied very uh, explicitly. They may have given just a very global measure of cognitive functioning and not broken it down into more finite domains. And so it's, again, it's just a little more difficult to draw those conclusions. So, you know, preliminarily it would look like aerobic activity is the better bet than yoga, but I think the jury's still a little bit out on, on those other forms of activity. And then walking. There's nothing I don't think particularly magical about walking other than the fact that it's been widely studied because lots of people do it and it's easy. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't require a gym membership. It doesn't really require special equipment other than shoes. So we just seem to have a lot of information about walking, but that's not necessarily to say that walking is somehow better than running or swimming or something else. It's just that we've recruit a lot of, of information about that and I think that's a helpful thing going back to what I just said because it's it's easy it doesn't require equipment most people can do it you know in your own neighborhood or find a, an easy place to go walk and so it's a good uh, skill uh, to recommend to, to folks that are trying to become more active. It's not very threatening uh, to say, let's just go take a walk. And it has been shown that regular physical activity, including walking, is associated with better cognitive function, less cognitive decline, and reduced risk of dementia. So it seems to exert a lot of the same positive benefits that slightly more aerobic activity would be, and the more aerobic you can make walking, the better. The other key, though, really seems to be is that you have to adhere to a consistent program, even in walking. So the second study cited there actually did not find overall a positive relationship between walking and cognitive functioning. They didn't find a relationship overall. But when they broke out their sample and looked at people who had most strictly adhered to the program that was presented to them, those people did reap a cognitive benefit. It was the people who hadn't been as good about doing the walking that didn't um, 
get the full benefit. So that's probably somewhat intuitive, but it, it's nice to, to really, again, see that it's important that it has to be a regular activity to, to maybe see the full cognitive benefits. And then it, it would be naive to think too that exercise is somehow happening in a vacuum, that, you're not, that nothing else is, is going on while you're exercising or that would be impacting your cognitive functioning. And, and, and we don't think that. Like I said, there's just been such an explosion lately of information looking at exercise, that was the focus. But um, it's also very notable to think about, well, what other uh, lifestyle factors or behavioral variables might be interacting or working together with physical activity to produce these cognitive benefits. Um, social interaction, as I briefly mentioned, there's been a recent study in, in mice as well looking at if you let uh, animals exercise but they are, they're isolated from any other animal contact versus animals who are allowed to exercise and have their social animal network. And those, in, those animals who have the social contact and the exercise fare better cognitively than those who only have the exercise. So again, Again, those you know there's very likely additional benefits to exercise because maybe again you're doing it in a group or you're going to the gym with friends or you're walking with a, a buddy or whatever similarly for health and diet factors um, it, it, it it follows that it matters what you take into your body. I, I explained the, the previous study about the high fat diet and the, the role that BDNF might play, but again, if you, know, you weren't ingesting a, a, a high fat diet, it might uh, allow the BDNF to work more efficiently in other areas. I mean, this is all just my own speculation at this point, but there are lots of folks doing the research now to try and look at these items all uh, together, or at least more than one. So instead of just looking at exercise, looking at exercise and social functioning, or exercise and diet, and seeing what combination then of things maybe provides the most benefit to our, our thinking skills. And not surprisingly then, engaging in a broad spectrum of activities seems to be more beneficial than picking one thing and, and only that one thing. And that actually goes along um, the lines of maintaining involvement in cognitively stimulating activities as well, which has also certainly been shown to impact our thinking as we get older, and that could be a, a whole other lecture in and of itself. So yeah, so now all of the what we don't know. Um, I've already alluded to a lot of a, a lot of these issues, um, and we're uh, like I said, trying to hammer out the details about okay. So when is it best to begin an exercise program? Certainly, there's evidence to suggest that earlier is better. But what about individuals who maybe have led a fairly sedentary life and at 80 decide they would like to become more active? You know, can we? predict with any reasonable amount of certainty that they might actually still be able to gain some, some cognitive benefits from that? Um, I would like to think the answer is yes, but you know the question at the bottom is, is it ever too late to start an exercise program to get cognitive benefits, that is? And, and I don't know that we, we uh, firmly know the answer to that. Next question is, again, what are the best varieties of exercise? What do I have to do? How intensely do I have to do it? How often do I have to do it? And how long do I have to do it? And there is no magic bullet yet to say, you know, this is exactly what you have to do and how long to, to get these cognitive benefits. Um, but again, there's, there's some guidelines to, to, to guide us as far as greater than 30 minutes may be, may be better. Uh, but we're still a long way from that, that prescription, so to speak. Um, more work for sure needs to be done in the benefits versus aerobic and non-aerobic activities. Again, with, with the advent of the popularity of, of yoga and other activities that do reap other health benefits, it'll be important to study them um, more systematically and try and find out if they have any uh, cognitive benefits that go along with them. Can we rely on self-report of physical activity? Certainly a lot of studies actually take objective measures of fitness, um, VO2 max and other, again, fitness variables, but a lot of them also to get a, a large base of data, simply ask people to tell us, what are you doing? What kinds of activities are you engaged in and how often do you do them? And we're never assuming that people are being purposefully not truthful to us, but we're sometimes not a very good 
uh, we don't assess very well how often we really do our physical activity or how did we really work out for an hour or was it only 50 minutes or so you know there's there's some variability there that that actually may impact some of these finer tuned measurements and and those will be important to figure out and what are the roles of pre-morbid health status uh, on fitness levels and ability to gain cognitive benefits from exercise. And again, these are all things that make the leap from the animal research to the human research a little more complicated. A lot of these things you can control for in, in the animal world and, and we certainly just can't do that in humans and that's the joy of, of all of us and our variability, but it also introduces sometimes a lot more questions than, than we have answers to. So in conclusion, the physical exercise really does seem to impart benefits for cognitive functioning as well as for overall brain health and integrity. And it holds, I think, an important promise as a non-pharmacologic strategy for delaying onset or at least slowing the rate of cognitive decline uh, with age. And with that, I'll show you one of my favorite pictures. And, and that's that. Thank you. Yeah, he wanted to know some more specifics about the way that exercise impacts the cholinergic response in the brain. And what does cholinergic mean? <laughs> Again, at a, at a very basic level, a lot of the, the cholinergic responses do impact the uh, our ability to perform cognitive functions. So it relates to things, like I said, long-term potentiation, which is a cascade of events that allow us to remember things. So, um, you know, I am probably not the very best person to explain in more detail that cholinergic reaction, and I don't, I don't know that we know that much. This is, again, one of those hypotheses about what might be happening with exercise. It's not that clear cut at this point. The, the question was, has anybody compared the, the impact on cognitive performance between physical versus mental activity? Not only mental, but intellectual. And intellectual activity. Um, the answer is, is yes, and it's, it's a little bit harder to answer than just sort of one is better than the other. The, the bigger picture answer really is that probably both are required and they're very hard to disentangle. Um, a recent meta-analysis was, was discussing that, that question really uh, explicitly and, and talking about that if you're focusing on, say, cognitive activity or intellectual stimulation, as a cohort, people who are more cognitively engaged and intellectually active actually do have a higher likelihood of participating in physical activity. So it's very hard to e extract one from the other. But it's a very reasonable question, like I said, because they don't happen in isolation. Nobody is simply exercising and, and doing nothing else, nothing else social or you no know, crossword puzzles or reading a new book or something. So, but they are, they're very hard to disentangle. Thanks, Thank you.